Well, I think if you look at history, there's no example of a technology that was not used for bad purposes by some people. Industrial technologies were obviously used for war and social control, and um, digital technologies have been used for mass surveillance, uh, you know, and, and social control, and um, and also now being used for war. So I, I think that you're going to see AI used for all these bad things, and uh, you know. It will be ambiguous as to whether or not it was humans directing AI to do bad things or AI doing bad things on its own, because we're very bad at attributing uh, intentionality to these constructs. But it, these things will be used for bad because everything else was too. But so far, I would argue that everything that we've ever invented has been, um, with maybe a one or two exceptions, has been used for more good than bad. Uh, that there hasn't yet been a technology that was unbalanced bad. And of course, we could have a nuclear holocaust tomorrow and I could be proven wrong after I was incinerated. So you never really know. But I am I think that our track record is good for using technologies for good. Hi, welcome back to Innovative Minds. I'm your host, T+. In this episode, we will discuss ways to depolarize public debate. But first... I want to ask Noah a crucial question. What is the secret to your productivity as an opinion writer? Uh, the secret to my productivity um, is uh, not having much of a life and sitting around with my rabbit writing. Um, no, the secret to my productivity is that I, um, I have a, a, a sort of a large base of knowledge and each post that I write is only a little bit addition, of addition to that. In, uh, um, combined with a lot of remixing of earlier stuff. So I just, each post is, you know, 2,000 words long, but it really only adds a little bit of new stuff, and most of the stuff is, is just for context, and that's very easy. And I think what this does, th this isn't a form of lazy writing, though. Uh, I, I tried to write novel stuff every time. It does take more time. Um, but I also found out that people could only assimilate a tiny bit of what I wrote, and that they would forget almost everything. And they would say, well, why don't you write about this? I was like, I just did write about that 300 columns ago. Weren't you reading them all? Don't you remember every paragraph of what I wrote? It didn't work. And so I realized that to get ideas into people's heads, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat. And so much of what I'm doing is, is rephrasing and repetition of things that I've written before. That is a good piece of advice for aspiring writers. On another note, Taiwan's parliamentary and presidential elections are scheduled for January 13th, 2024. Audrey, how is your ministry preparing for this event? That's a great question. Um, in general, we have seen, uh, especially around last August, uh, a couple of weeks before our ministry started, uh, there's a record number of denial of service attacks, uh, 23 times in a single day compared to the previous peak, uh, just trying to shut down the ministry's websites uh, in Taiwan. Uh, that, by the way, uh, is the same hour as the missiles start flying uh, over our head, so it's a hybrid form of attack. So what we have seen is that previously uh, disjoint uh, forms of attack, uh, cyber attack, propaganda, information manipulation, traditional kinetic stuff, and so on. They used to uh, belong to different branches. They are seldom uh, coordinated. Uh, but starting last August, we've seen uh, newfound coordination uh, between these different hybrid forms of, of attack. Uh, and so after our ministry started, we set up the National Institute of Cybersecurity that includes defenses not only on traditional cyber threats, but also on information integrity threats. Uh, and that means that we need to counter not just the you know election meddling, as you said, but also um, f um, like international fraud, uh, people voice cloning um, the, our citizens' um, vocal points, uh, fingerprints, right, of their sound, and then using that to automate calls to their friends and families uh, and try to sell them on cryptocurrencies or something like that. And it is a, a real problem. And in a sense, it echoes what Noah said in that these are small, 
relative to election scale damages, but it causes real damages uh, to people's uh, trust and also financial well-being. And so that motivated new laws that says uh, if somebody is conned uh, by a deep fake that Facebook is aware of but didn't take it down, uh, and that somebody is conned for one million, then um, well, Facebook is now in Taiwan liable for that one million. And, and that's motivated them to invest in civic integrity and information integrity. Uh, defenses. So I would say this is a multi-pronged defense that is centered on protecting information integrity. And we've been reusing a lot of the cybersecurity response systems to share the indicators of threats and so on with international democratic allies. Uh, we also have drills. Uh, so we invite people to work as a red team right, for a couple of days to try to attack our information ecosystem uh, from abroad. Uh, and then we're also doing purple teaming, which is is that we invite people who just freshly play the red team role to sit down with our defenses so that we can see what kind of novel attack strategies can be mitigated by more coordinated uh, defense. So just more drills uh, and applying the cybersecurity mindset to more domains than traditional cybersecurity has been our way to uh, prepare for the upcoming election, which is just the first in line in a long year of elections in a rolling fashion across pretty much all the democratic polities. Audrey has just listed some threats that can weigh on the fabric of trust in a democratic system. Another factor contributing to societal division is the relationship between education level and political preferences. In light of this, how can we effectively communicate with individuals who either lack a college education or have less formal training, Noah? Well, I think um, the background here is that American social institutions have largely degraded, which is to say that people don't go to church much anymore. Corporations have at-will employment, and people don't spend much of their life with the same employer. So you don't build, uh, you know, work teams that are sort of like families the way you do in Japan, which has obvious downsides. But that doesn't happen in America anymore. Um, because of mobility, social mobility, and urban sprawl, and uh, many other factors, uh, sort of local social organizations don't um, don't have as much pull anymore. You know, you don't have the bowling league is the famous example, right? Um, and so m many of these social institutions that used to bind us together to people in local space are gone. And we have one left that works. Oh, and the, and the military has been downsized. Um, you know, it's, it's no longer true that everyone, uh, most people serve in the military. And of course, that's good because it's, it's because we stopped uh, going to war uh, in big wars. We now have just small wars where the professional military handles it all. What that means is that there's not much... Uh, contact through serving in the military jointly with people. And so there's very few places where Americans all get together and meet each other and learn to iron out their differences and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's one institution left, which is college. It is the one functional social institution left in America, and it only works for a little less than half the people. So you've got half, the, half of the people in America subject to this very strong social institution uh, that teaches them certain values and health and whatnot and, you know, employment and skills and all these things and builds community and networks and da 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 and d exposes people to diversity, teaches them about people different than themselves, and you have a little less than half the people in the country using that institution. And the progressive solution to that was free college for everybody. So everyone goes to college, K through 12, uh, which is our existing compulsory public or pu public education, let's say, um, K through universal public education, but will would then become K through 16, and that college would just become four more years of school that everyone goes to, and that um, and th this dream has basically failed. That dream's completely failed because it turns out that that's for a lot of people that's too long to take out of your working life. That's you know the human lifespan didn't increase enough to really do this. Um, and a lot of people just can't handle the amount of technical work in college because they're not well prepared by a family background or good schools or whatever. They're not as well prepared. And so they can't handle it. And so as a result, uh, the dream of universal college, we can get marginally there by increasing the number of people who go to college, but we, we, we stalled out at a little less than 50% and college enrollment rates have now been going down. And of course, uh, you know, people on the left, have wanted to make universal free college so that you remove the cost barrier. But 
evidence shows that it's not from Europe where they don't have uh, college fees shows that there's a, this is by far not the only barrier and may not even be the most important one. And so um, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, we need to build new institutions that work for people who don't go to college. And I don't know what those should be. And so I'm, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I haven't solved this one yet. Um, so in Taiwan, uh, in the population between uh, 25 and 64, uh, the people who've got a college education is over half, I think 55 uh, percent, which is the same as Japan and next only to Canada. Uh, so we have seen like very good uh, social bonding over college, exactly the same effect as Noah said. Uh, now being not part of that 55 percent, I only completed, uh, you know, second year of junior high education myself, uh, I find myself still uh, benefit from a robust higher education ecosystem, especially in the form of community colleges. Uh, in Taiwan, there is a strong tradition of community colleges that provide some sort of uh, college education. Uh, the diploma system was slightly different uh, compared to universities, but the, the same social bonding is there. So it's quite popular for people uh, to contribute to their community by devoting some time, maybe they fresh retired, maybe they're uh, between jobs and so on, uh, by serving as a, a mentor, a tutor and so on uh, in their local community colleges. Uh, so in Taiwan, we're at a point where people who want to enter a formal university uh, with a time commitments and so on can more often than not do so. The admittance rate is 96% or so. Uh, but for people who don't want to make this kind of time commitment, maybe they still have uh, jobs or a family to take care, they can still take advantage of community college that offers the same social bonding experience minus the time commitments required for universities. It's great to hear how education can foster trust among individuals. Through your posts, Noah, you also try to appeal to all sections of the population. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I mean, I, I make a choice not to be polarized. It is difficult to do that. Um, the most effective type of polarization is uh, negative polarization, where you think that some other group of people is out to get you. And therefore, you think these people suck and I hate them. And you start to interpret all the events in the world as reflecting negatively on the group of people you don't like. And, and negative polarization is very easy on the internet because people will attack you and then you decide that they're evil and then you your worldview just cements itself from there. But you know, I, I try not to be uh, not to be polarized. Um, that doesn't mean I have a positive view of every group. I have a very negative view of some groups of people. But um, but I I I try to not. Um, so so Carl Schmidt, the Nazi uh, legal scholar, uh, who is now beloved of the um, Chinese administration of Hong Kong, uh, and um, Wang Huning, I believe, is a big fan of Carl Schmidt. But he basically said that the key to society is to pick an enemy and attack that enemy, right? Figure out who your enemy is and unite everyone around attacking that enemy. And of course, you can see a direct line from that to, uh, you know, the Holocaust, the uh, World War II invasion of, of Soviet Union and uh, things like that in Germany. Um, but, and you, but you can also see um, communist countries doing the exact same thing. You could see a focus on, you know, the Cultural Revolution or Stalin's purges, you could see, let's find the reactionary. Let, who's the running dog of capitalism? Let's put a hat on their head and like beat them or maybe eat them. I don't know, whatever. Uh, and so, so you could see this. Um, it was all very Schmidtian, right? Carl Schmidt. And this idea that you need this and find the enemy and unite around attacking this enemy. And um, this, this is negative polarization. That's, that is what social media has been pushing us to do. Um, and this is how people exist on Twitter. Uh, the, the platform formerly known as Twitter, now known as X, the everything app. Um, but on this, you can absolutely see this dynamic at work constantly. People pick a team and just attack everyone who's not on the team, defend everyone who is on the team, and it's just gang warfare. And so um, that is the hellish endpoint of Carl Schmidt thought. We must find a better way. We must find something better than Schmidtism. I see. One of the recurring themes in your posts is the benefits of a fragmented global internet for depolarizing public discourse. Could you explain why you believe this to be the case? 
Uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, um, community moderation has always been the most effective um, method of keeping the peace on the internet. And I will notice that community moderation often fails. You have the famous example of the Something Awful forums in which the uh, moderator Richard Lotex Kyanka uh, attempted to fight his entire forum by himself for a period of years and just destroyed the forum in the process. So community, mo but everyone went somewhere else. And that's the second thing. Uh, the second good reason, um, the second reason fragmentation is good is the possibility of exit. So if you don't know, uh, there's this, um, uh, Albert Hirschman wrote, exit voice and loyalty. When you have disagreements, you can do three things. You can um, just obey and submit. You can fight and, and battle, or you can just leave. You can walk up walk out, pick up, and leave. Now, you know, obviously a good society needs some mix of these, right? We can't just have everyone always picking up and leaving everywhere. Uh, some libertarians imagined that you could organize societies that way, but even if you try to do the math of this in economics with the Tibu equilibrium, it doesn't work. Um, there's, too many, uh, there's too many public goods problems for this. Um, and so you can't do that, but you do need some exit. You need people to be able to leave and um, what we used to call finding your people. We need people to be able to go find a space where you feel comfortable or else you'll just feel uncomfortable all the time. And so the fragmentation of the internet really is safe spaces. That's what it's about. And people make fun of that term, uh, but, but that's actually what it always was. And so now you have the central platforms of Facebook and Twitter. Discussion is really fragmenting into DM groups, Discord, uh, other platforms like the ones you mentioned, um, but mostly just private groups, actually. That's where most of the real discussion is happening now. And this is good. You know, it's good. Um, the less that the central platforms of formerly Twitter, I mean, Facebook isn't really even like this anymore. In Facebook, all, all discussion of current affairs really now happens not in the feed, but in groups that you join. So it's really just X right? Where everyone just goes to scream and scream and scream. Even on Reddit, you know, you have subreddits that's divided. Um, really, it's just Twitter where people go to scream and scream and scream. And I think that the less, uh, if the less important Twitter is to our national conversation, the better it is for that national conversation because humanity was not meant to occupy a single town square. People call Twitter the digital town square. Uh, but in the past, we had many towns with many town squares. And if you didn't like what people were shouting in one town square, one, as an ex, one thing you could do was move to another town, right? And so it's, it's bad if you only have one town square for the whole world. It makes no sense. And so I am glad to see Twitter's position in the information ecosystem diminished because I think that will further a healthy fragmentation of the discussion. Well, it's quite fortunate that Taiwan never had much of a Twitter uh, user base anyway. <laughs> it's not uh, having any uh, significant um, influence uh, on our political information landscape. Uh, and I, I totally agree. I mean, community moderation is the only kind of moderation that offers kind of democratic choices. Uh, like if you, if you don't like your moderator, uh, the, the worst thing uh, they can do is just force you to migrate to another community, which is very easy nowadays. So uh, I think this kind of uh, democratic way to find your people eventually uh, is a very good thing. I see. So it's important for people with shared values to be able to come together and establish their own rules of communication. Any other ideas to share on this topic, Audrey? When Noah uh, visited Taiwan, uh, we had this pizza dinner party. Uh, well, really just a conversation, <laughs> the content of which uh, is online. And uh, Noah brought up this, this very good idea of a uh, love boat, uh, which for context is what our overseas compatriot um, commission offered to people of uh, Taiwanese descent uh, to visit Taiwan and have a good time and do social bonding and know more about the Taiwanese people uh, and the society. Now, uh, 
So in the open source or the commons um, on the internet, we tend to find our safe spaces by making creative outputs that adds to the commons, uh, like literally blog posts or YouTube uh, or whatever, uh, that is uh, licensed in a more liberal fashion so that people can remix on our ideas and eventually we discover our people. And so um, we introduced, uh, thanks to Noah's input, uh, the digital gold card program, where anyone who makes contribution to the commons on the internet for eight years are now welcome to enjoy, um, you know, universal health care and residency and everything that Taiwan has to offer an open work permit uh, for three years. And if you like it, then you get to renew. And on the fifth year, if you decide to become uh, Taiwanese, you get to become a Taiwanese without giving up your original passport. So uh, like making everyone a overseas compatriot, so to speak, uh, if you contribute to the commons for eight years. So uh, I think this kind of uh, innovation is, I would argue, also a social institution innovation because it redefines what it means to be a Taiwanese. Uh, and also it expands the idea of safe space from what's used to be only online into something also. Uh, actually, you can just come to Taiwan and stay in it if your original uh, jurisdiction or regime isn't that conductive uh, to open commons uh, kind of thinking. It's good to hear that your pizza party led to such an innovative scheme. In the same line of thought, Noah, in an article published in January 2023, you proposed the idea that the internet has redefined the meaning of community for most of us. Could you tell us more about that? That's a really interesting question. So to, to recap what I was writing about, um, in the old days, your community would be, because communication was done through physical proximity, your community would also be the people uh, in, in your same town. And those are also the people that you share government with right? Those are the people with whom you work out who is in charge and who provides public goods. And so information and governance were contiguous. They were occupying the same areas. Now you may spend your entire, your, your social community may be online. You may spend it with uh, anime fans or, um, you know, p other people with a similar background to you living in other places or, um, you know, a political group online, et cetera, et cetera. These things I call vertical communities because I, I, um, I mixed my metaphor here. Horizontal was actually literally horizontal in physical space while vertical is more like a product vertical. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, it made a good uh, tagline. So then, um, but w when, the, when the people that you interact with socially are not the same people that you need to uh, provide public goods with, that could be a problem. Um, when you, the people who live near you are just complete strangers to you and all the people you know and care about are online. Uh, and yet it is not possible to provide public goods through online uh, verticals. So my friend, my college friend, Balaji Srinivasan, whom you may know, believes in something he calls network states. Um, believe me, Balaji was the same in college. <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> very consistent. He's been very consistent. Actually, well, he was a grad student when I was an undergrad. But, um, but Balaji believes in network states. So he believes that the vertical communities can actually become providers of public goods. So uh, diasporas would be examples of this. And while I think there's a few cases in which this can sort of do some things, you can have diasporas helping each other and providing a few transnational public goods. Overwhelmingly, that's imp just technologically impossible. Overwhelmingly, public goods are provided through local space because they involve physical networks such as sewage systems and roads and classes where you still have to be in class because Zoom University didn't work during the pandemic and, and, and many local public goods and policing, crime. Public goods are often in physical space, uh, whereas, you know, so, so I don't think Balaji's network state idea is going to work. You know, imagine walking down the street and someone from a different network state uh, mugs you and who's going to arrest them and then your network states go to war. It's just a recipe for universal gang warfare. Um, that's bad. It's not going to work. Balaji, um, it, good try, Balaji. Um, thank you for, for trying that idea, but it's not going to work. And so um, we need some way to get people to uh, bond in horizontal communities, which doesn't mean eliminating vertical communities. It doesn't mean you don't find your people online, but I think that we need some way of also having people uh, know their neighbors and work things out with their neighbors in, in real space or even over the internet, but at least if it's people who live near you. Um, 
we need more of that. And so, uh, and of course, you know, I, I have the easy job of saying we need more of this. And Audrey has the hard job of saying, well, mm -hmm. here, I just invented a totally new way to do this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so, um, but, but that's why, uh, that's why Audrey is more important than me. So. Yeah, thought leadership is equally important. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, I totally agree. I think in terms of the public goods problem, it only can be solved by people learning to manage their local commons and eventually organizing their own multi-stakeholder meetings that involves only 200 people before uh, people can progress to the second degree, meaning that uh, you know we don't know each other, but we both know somebody that we trust, and that extends to around um, 20,000 people, uh, and then the third degree and the fourth degree and so on. It never works in a top-down, flattened way of the UN simply saying, oh, the internet should work like this, and everybody magically uh, make the internet work like that. Uh, in fact, um, I think UN recognized uh, this, and so um, around um, the time of the WSIS, uh, which was in uh, Tunisia um, in uh, 2005, they said that, okay, so maybe the internet should be governed in a way that is not the same as each uh, member states uh, govern their own thing. It's rather should be structured around interest groups and working groups and the kind of groups that share a similar interest, but the UN should provide a space for people to meet each other in a physical space so that we still uh, build social bonds instead of just meeting on mailing lists and so on. And so I think this is the best of both worlds, the local grassroots Internet Governance Forum get to uh, mobilize on a, a city, on a nation, a country, on Asia Pacific, like all different uh, scales. And finally, um, every year people meet in a UN space uh, and build social bonds that they can then take uh, back uh, to their community and their hybrid meetings and so on. So yeah, I think this kind of uh, hybrid, multilateral, multi-stakeholder, fractal-ish um, governance mechanism is the kind of government mechanism that will uh, carry us uh, to the age of AI and beyond. Now I want to talk more about Taiwan. Noah, if my information is correct, you came to Taiwan once, and it was after writing your article Taiwan as a Civilization. What struck you most about your visit here? Well, you know, I, I use the, the term civilization fairly loosely. Uh, people are like, what is a civilization? Well, Texas is a civilization. I come it's a from video there. game. But... <laughs> Um, possibly it is a video game. Um, uh, although, although the best civilization game ever was Master of Orion 2. Uh, okay. If you remember, okay. if you're old enough yes, to remember. Yes, I, I do. And, and Alien Crossfire isn't that bad. Um, mm. Alpha Centauri, right? Uh, right? Alpha Centauri was quite good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, although the religions could use a little work. But, yeah. um, but uh, let me think. What was I saying? I was saying about Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is so so um I lived for years in Japan and I go back for about a month out of every year and um it is really an interesting place and you know everyone knows how interesting and unique and cool Japan is in the whole world um uh it is legendary and there's a few other places like that France right but but Taiwan is completely yes Taiwan flies under the radar completely. There's not much of a, an international consciousness of Taiwanese, um, uh, you know, ideas, uh, culture, traditions, urbanism, fun things to do. And when I went to Taiwan, I expected it, you know, most people go to Taiwan expecting it to be like China. And I went to Taiwan expecting it to be more like Japan. Um, and it wasn't either. It was extremely different. Uh, in fact, I wrote the Taiwan as a Civilization post before I went to mm -hmm. Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it based entirely on things that my Taiwanese friends told me. Um, and so I just thought that it was a thing people needed to know. And I couldn't wait to go on some trip, especially because it was still pandemic during that time. And um, uh, so I just wrote it, you know, but but I wrote another follow up piece that I think had much more insight into on the on the ground realities of what Taiwan is really like. And I, it's, it's hard to describe in words. If you famously, almost everyone who tries to describe Japan in words fails and just ends up saying some BS. 
And uh, you have to go there to understand what it's really like. And Taiwan is the same, of course. And in fact, I mean, France is the same. America is the same. But um, if you asked me what are some of the things that stood out about Taiwan to me, one thing is that Taiwan is incredibly tolerant and laid back. The closest comparison I could think of is actually the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Um, which is an interesting comparison. Actually, the Netherlands did colonize Taiwan briefly, but um, and they, they they both have economies based on like one large semiconductor company. <laughs> but, so, exactly, so, ASML and TSMC, respectively. <laughs> yes, and you're always in danger of getting hit by a scooter in both places. <laughs> but um, but there's but you know Taiwan was just incredibly laid back, and that's not something I can say about, for example, Japan. Uh, certainly not the United States. Um, Taiwan is is really an extremely laid back country. People work hard, but they don't um, get uptight about things and take things really seriously. And mostly, this is a good thing. It also does result in um, the tall buildings in Taiwan looking a little shabby, which I always complain about. <laughs> but it is it is really relaxing to be in Taiwan. You feel completely relaxed. Uh, it is a, um, and uh, and so I think that that was the first thing I noticed. I also noticed um, uh, the expats in Taiwan were nice and smart. That is unusual. Having known many many expats in life, I will say that expat communities tend to have large amounts of people who had some reason why they're not living in their home country. Many nice, normal people are expats, but then expat communities often tend to be biased toward the crazies. And um, not in Taiwan. It was the most that I wanted to go hang out, not just not just with local people, which I did, but but also with expats. And that, that's pretty cool. So Taiwan, I think that meant that Taiwan felt like an international place in that it was a place where where good people could just could just go from, all, you know, a lot of corners of the world. And that's that's what made me suggest bringing back Love Boat, because Love Boat, although it was focused on people who were either Taiwanese or Chinese in of descent. Right. It was um, it brought people from all over the world and from all these different cultures together. And in in Taiwan, and Taiwan was just this place that served as a as um, a great location for these people to all meet and mingle. And I saw in that expat community an echo of what I imagine Love Boat must have been like um, back in the day. And um, uh, but you know, with people who were obviously of various backgrounds, um, and so that was that was pretty great. Also, the food's great. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, and. Uh, um... Of course, uh, the next time you come to Taiwan, uh, we will uh, have a, another pizza party, a public ceremony uh, where I present you uh, the gold card and we launch the digital love boat. How about that? <laughs> that sounds great, except can we actually just do some uh, Chinese food next time? Uh, of course, of course. We're okay. very tolerant. Yeah. <laughs> I have pizza so much. I have okay. pizza so often, you know. Yeah, maybe we have uh, Cong You Bing, which is a kind of pizza. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Scallion oil pancakes are indeed delicious. To conclude this interview, I want to ask both of you, what are some emerging trends or issues you believe are underrepresented in public discourse that we should pay more attention to? Let's go to Noah first. Emerging trends and issues. Well, so economically, I think industrial policy is going to be the big one. And here, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to realize that there's a number of reasons why the laissez-faire economics of the late 20th century, while good for many things, and certainly a needed shot in the arm for countries like China and India at the time, um, is not necessarily working for us now along many fronts, including climate change, um, you know, national security, and various other uh, objectives that we need to do now. There's a paradigm shift underway. And I think that um, here, Taiwan has important things to teach the United States and other countries, including in Europe. Um, Taiwan's creation, uh, the, the government helped to create TSMC. You had private entrepreneurs, uh, Morris Chang creating TSMC, uh, but you had, and, and other people, but then you had generous government support um, and it was very successful, which has been not as often the case in, in you know, other countries, but certainly Taiwan has a lot to teach 
uh, about industrial policy. And I think people are not, like lots of people talk about industrial policy, but I think it hasn't yet penetrated people's minds the degree to which the economic paradigm of the world is, is in the process of shifting to that. Yeah, um, so I think the concept of uh, digital public infrastructure or DPIs, uh, while you know being kind of fringe uh, before the pandemic, has now uh, coming full swing, and um, in part thanks to this new fringe shoring uh, tendency that Noah just uh, alluded to, uh, we now see uh, things like community nodes, things like identity systems, payment system, and things like that. Uh, if you overly rely on a provider that is fundamentally at odds um, with your priorities, uh, then uh, relying on public uh, infrastructure providers that are actually serving, well, I guess also the public, but their public, uh, doesn't quite work uh, in this day and age. Um, in the Internet Governance Forum uh, this year, which I was just uh, attending in Kyoto, uh, they were talking about the ideas of building the layers of Internet from the basic protocols, which is about email and things like that, uh, but all the way up now to identity and payment and many other stuff. Uh, and uh, the implementations of those protocols, if it come from a friendly government uh, or the um, you know contractors of that government and passed the cybersecurity audits and so on from that government, and if you're a friendly ally government, actually the most rational thing for you to do is just to use the same system. Uh, Estonia has been uh, doing that for quite a while. Their XRO system is co-created with Iceland, with Finland, and so on, which share not just physical vicinity, but also uh, neighborhood on values, so to speak. But at the IGF, what we've been hearing is that, for example, the India stack, uh, which is very uh, appealing to ma many of the majority world, uh, can be done now uh, with very cheap uh, but highly accurate machine translation powered by generative AI uh, that can then serve much more communities than the original languages uh, it serves. So I think, yeah, it's uh, a complement to the industry policy that Noah alluded to. And this is a kind of French shoring that doesn't create um, like public good problem, but rather it helps solving the, the commons problem and coordination problems. I want to express my sincere gratitude to both of you for sharing your valuable insights and optimistic views. Together, we have discussed ways of depolarizing the public debate and the future of technology. And if you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe, share and let us know what you think. See you next time on Innovative Minds. Live long and prosper. Hello, I'm Noah Smith, blogger at No Opinion. See you on Taiwan Plus. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. See you on Taiwan Plus.